Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. Hello and welcome, automotive world. My name is Sean Tipping. This is the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. I am very happy to be here today talking with you. Today, we're going to get into part two of a three-part series involving engine mechanical testing using scopes. In the previous episode, we discussed using a scope to measure relative compression of an engine, using the starter current to measure the compression for each cylinder without taking anything apart. If you haven't checked that episode out, Uh, Go ahead, go back one episode. It's number 24, and you can get filled in on that and also get brought up to speed on the case study, which we will complete at the end of this episode. But today, we're going to get into in-cylinder pressure testing, and I really think this is very cool. Um, You know, I, I mentioned before, I'm kind of a nerd about this sort of stuff, and although admittedly, it's not always the most practical test. I'm not doing this on as many vehicles as I would a relative compression test or some other simpler tests. Being able to see what we can see with an in-cylinder pressure test sometimes is extremely valuable and allows us to be very accurate in our diagnosis, but it's also just awesome to be able to see what's happening inside of a cylinder pressure wise to be able to see inside of an engine now we can do that somewhat with some conventional testing methods that we've mentioned before like a compression gauge Uh, and this kind of would be the comparison to a compression gauge this in cylinder pressure testing but if nothing else i really think learning about in cylinder pressure testing, analyzing the waveforms, really understanding what's going on, I feel like I have a better understanding of the four stroke cycle. Being able to visualize what's going on inside of a cylinder. Because otherwise, you know, we're just imagining it in our heads. We're trying to understand these pressure changes that are going on with something that we really can't even see. But to take it, draw it out, on a graph as a line showing the pressure levels as the engine goes through the four-stroke cycle or the one cylinder that we're measuring goes through the four-stroke cycle for me at least it gives me a better understanding so i would say if you don't want to invest in the equipment that's necessary to do this testing which i understand it's it's not cheap if you want the setup that i'm going to be talking about today Uh, there are some cheaper options available but It's worth your time just to understand these waveforms. And I'm going to give you several resources today where you can do that, where you can find more information. Because honestly, explaining the exact waveform analysis just doesn't really work in a podcast. I can post some pictures and stuff like that, but I figured what would be best is, you know, for details on the waveform, I'm going to give you some other resources that you can utilize if you want to hear more about this. But today we're going to talk about, you know, what this is, what the capabilities are of this testing, and I'm going to involve a couple case studies just to show real life applications. But again, I think taking the time to understand these waveforms, to really analyze them and understand what you're seeing gives you a better understanding of the four stroke cycle and in turn is going to make you a better technician when we're diagnosing problems involving pressure changes in the engine in the cylinder involving the four stroke cycle which obviously we do a lot but let's get into it here when we are doing a in cylinder pressure testing really what we're doing is something similar to a traditional compression test where we take an adapter, we remove the spark plug, we put this adapter threaded into the spark plug tube, and we connect a gauge to it. We either crank or run the engine and we measure the pressure that's read on a gauge with a needle. That is our conventional compression test. Now an in-cylinder pressure test 
that we're going to use a scope with, we're going to, again, remove the spark plug. So keep in mind, for all the testing that we're talking about today, there's no actual uh, combustion event happening because there's no spark. But we're seeing the pressure changes inside the cylinder, which is what we're after. But what we're doing is we are removing the spark plug. We're putting an adapter in. Now, do keep in mind this adapter is not your traditional compression gauge adapter hose. They need to be a little stiffer. Um, otherwise, the flexation from the adapter can actually affect these waveforms, the detail uh, that we need to be accurate. So uh, some of these kits will come with adapters, but if you're to make your own, keep in mind you want to get an adapter hose that goes into the cylinder that's going to be a little stiffer than your conventional one. But we are putting that adapter hose into the spark plug opening and we are connecting a pressure transducer to that adapter hose in place of a traditional compression gauge. Now what this pressure transducer does is it takes the pressure level from inside the cylinder and it converts it into a voltage which can be read on our scope. Because the scope really is only ever realistically telling us one thing, it's voltage over time. We use our different leads and attachments to measure different things like amperage and pressure and obviously we can measure voltage. but the scope itself can only measure voltage and that's what the pressure transducer is going to do it is going to convert a pressure level into a voltage and then we can read it on the scope and make the correlation to the actual pressure level now as far as tooling goes there are several different makes and models out there i know snap-on has a model i've never used it personally i've actually seen a lot of people build their own pressure transducers um, just buying parts online and constructing it and actually gotten somewhat decent waveforms. The one I'm going to really be talking about today is the PicoScope WPS pressure transducer. And this one is considerably more expensive, but uh, it's far more accurate than any other one that I've seen. And it's really the only one I've ever used, so it's the only one that I can speak to as far as the actual use. Um, but do keep in mind there are cheaper options. Uh, you may sacrifice a little bit of accuracy or detail if you're using a cheaper model, especially maybe if you want to construct one your own. But there, there are possibilities out there. Anyways, we are connected into a single cylinder and we are either going to crank or start and run the engine. And Instead of watching a needle on a gauge, we're going to watch a line on a scope. And this line is going to move up and down, correlating with the pressure that is in that cylinder at that time. Again, cranking or running. And if you have the PicoScope set up, it's going to actually correlate the voltage with a pressure level for you. So you don't have to do the conversion yourself, which makes it very convenient. Um, and again, that's the way I like doing it. It's hooking up the WPS and then just setting up the Pico so it shows me a pressure level. So I can be very accurate in the pressure level that I'm seeing. So we can use this as a conventional compression test where we're measuring the peak compression being developed by that piston when it's at top dead center on the compression stroke. Same thing as we would see in the needle. Now that's only one thing that we can do with this. We're not just seeing that compression peak though that we would on a traditional gauge. We're seeing everything in between. And what I mean in between, in between the two compression strokes for that cylinder. Okay, so we have a four stroke cycle going on. It's not just the compression stroke. We have the power exhaust and intake stroke as well. And during all of those, even if we don't have an actual combustion event happening, we are still going to experience pressure changes within that engine as we're going down on the power or sometimes called the expansion stroke when we're coming up on the exhaust stroke when we're coming down on the intake stroke pressure changes are happening valves are open the pistons moving and this is where this tool can really shine for us because we can analyze those pressure changes inside the cylinder to tell us you know, what's what's going on with this engine? Again, this is all mechanical issues that we're after. Uh, you know, if you're after a misfire for a fuel or spark issue, this isn't really going to help you much, although you can verify spark timing, ignition timing using this method as well. But this, again, what we're talking about is mechanical engine failures, okay? So worn camshaft lobes, valve timing issues, broken valve spring possibly, 
and even things outside of the cylinder itself, we can see things like exhaust restrictions, okay? Because with these pressure changes, we not only see what's happening inside the cylinder, but when the exhaust valve is open, we're seeing what's happening downstream as well. So we can actually pick up exhaust restrictions using this method as well. So that's the next step that I'm actually going to get into is where can we use this? Now, again, it'd be great if I could show you everything detailed about the waveform. We could break it down by stroke and show you all the details. Again, I'm going to give you some references to do some homework yourself if you're interested in this because doing it via audio just doesn't work that great. But what I can explain using the podcast is where I use this, what kind of problems we can identify. Well, first, just like I mentioned, we can see exhaust restrictions inside the cylinder. Okay, because again, remember where we're threaded into, we have an adapter hose that is threaded in place of the spark plug opening, pistons moving up and down, and we're seeing the pressures in the cylinder. But once, you know, the engine's just a big air pump, and once the exhaust valve is open, if we have a restricted catalytic converter or restricted exhaust in any manner, it is actually going to represent that same pressure level inside of the cylinder okay the pistons coming up trying to push exhaust out but it can't because downstream there's a plugged up cat that's actually going to raise the pressure level inside the cylinder as well as in the exhaust but we can see that in cylinder so in some vehicles this becomes very very useful think of a v style engine that has three different catalytic converters okay so we have our two main catalytic converters that are monitored by the o2s and then you have a downstream cat as well now a lot of times what happens is one of those upstream cats shells it breaks apart and it goes downstream and plugs up the back one that's probably the most common thing that i see but what if you just had one upstream cat that was plugged up and you know you weren't sure which side it was you probably have misfires on that side of the engine but you could verify by going in cylinder and actually running the engine and watching to see during our exhaust stroke do we have elevated pressure and again i'm not going to go into details on the waveform uh, you can find that elsewhere but that is one of my favorite ways to identify an exhaust restriction now if it's a very severe exhaust restriction we do have other ways of uh, checking for it but it's somewhat intrusive because we're taking the spark plug out, but we don't have to take any exhaust apart and we know, do we have an exhaust restriction? Does this thing need a catalytic converter? Do we have to drop the exhaust on this thing? Where I live, all those <laughs> exhaust components are extremely rusted and we're probably going to have to get out the torch or break some stuff just to get it apart. Um, it's either that or, you know, pulling an O2, which is not going back in <laughs> because it's rusted or drilling holes and welding them back up. You know, obviously there's a number of ways we can check for exhaust restrictions but this is a really accurate way and it even can tell us what side of the engine if that's in question but exhaust restrictions is one thing that we can measure using this in cylinder pressure testing uh, another one that we can see that we're actually seeing this a lot on vehicles at least on the domestic side of things i think of the chevy 5.3 liters and the dodge 5.7 liter engines that we see in the trucks uh, is worn cam lobes this is obviously going to cause a misfire, and depending on which cam lobe is worn, it may not be easy to spot using a compression gauge. I mentioned in the last episode that I don't really use my conventional compression gauge too often anymore, and the reason being is it can mislead you. And I'll, I'll explain why, but this insulin or pressure transducer is really going to allow us to see is one of these cam lobes worn down which would change when and how long that particular valve is open for and we can again see this in the waveform and once we understand it we can analyze it we know what the pressure level should look like we can say yes this intake cam or this exhaust cam lobe has actually worn down and it's not opening that valve as far open as it needs to be or for as how long it needs to be open and so you know it's going to need a camshaft and probably a lifter at that point as well or a set of lifters but anyways again all we're doing is pulling a spark plug putting this in we can make that call without taking anything apart now how could a mechanical gauge mislead you here well if you had a worn exhaust camshaft lobe Okay, so the 
cam lobe comes up and it's supposed to be opening that exhaust valve and it's not or it's not opening it fully, what's going to happen is obviously a misfire uh, because we can't evacuate the cylinder. The piston comes up. It should be pushing those spent exhaust gases out and down out the tailpipe, but it can't because that valve is not opening or it's not opening fully. But it's not going to allow fresh air to be drawn in on that intake stroke. And so we're going to have a misfire. If you can't get oxygen in there, it doesn't matter how much fuel you add or how much compression you have, you're not going to fire that cylinder. So you have a misfire, but if you were to go and you were to measure that with a compression gauge that has a needle, it's actually going to measure pretty good compression because when that piston comes up on its compression stroke, that cylinder should still seal pretty well unless it has another problem on top of it. But let's say the Warren exhaust cam lobe is the only problem. It is still going to seal when that piston comes up on compression. You're going to get a good number. But when it comes up on that exhaust stroke, it's almost like having another mini compression stroke because the exhaust cam lobe is not opening up that valve. All right? We expect the exhaust valve to be open when we come up on the exhaust stroke. We don't develop a whole lot of pressure inside of that cylinder at that point. But if that valve's not opening properly, we are going to build up some pressure on that exhaust stroke. And we're not going to see that on a gauge. A gauge is just going to show us this was your peak compression and that needle is going to stay there. And so it might be a tough thing to identify using just a gauge. You're going to see that in the pressure transducer waveform. You're going to see your compression stroke, but then you're also going to see on that exhaust stroke that, okay, we've got pressure during this exhaust stroke and I don't expect to see it here. And then that's when you can make the call. We must have an exhaust valve opening problem. And, you know, it, there, there's obviously other things that can cause that as well, but worn camshaft lobe, that's one of the things that we can identify. Valve timing is actually one of the other things that we can do. Now, very similar to, uh, you know, a worn cam lobe, if our valve timing is off, meaning the valve is, in this case, it would open for the correct duration, but the timing of the opening and closing of the valve is off, we can actually make that call as well. And I'm going to give you a reference to a couple of videos that you can watch with Bernie Thompson and John Thornton. And they give you really great detail on how you make these calls. But the fact of the matter is that we can see valve timing with a certain margin of error in these waveforms. And that can be really powerful. Now, there's other ways to spot valve timing, okay? Cam and crank synchronization, if the camshaft has moved in reference to the crank. We can... There's, there's other ways to monitor that. Obviously, you might have a code from the computer. The computer's watching that stuff. We can do a cam and a crank sync with using the actual sensors, the position sensors that monitor those shafts. And then we can compare them to a known good. We can say, yes, this is out of time. But here's a scenario for you that I've run into plenty of times where the computer doesn't pick up the problem, at least not as a timing issue. And if you were to do a cam crank sync, you'd actually come out with what would match a known good. So I'm going to give you an example here. This was a Ford F-150 with a 5.4 liter Triton engine. Lots and lots of problems on these engines. Well, I had a bank of cylinders that was misfiring. And I had some other symptoms that led me towards this way, but it's, I suspected cam timing, but there were no timing codes in this computer. And now this does have camshaft sensors on both banks because it actually has VVT, variable cam timing, that changes the position of the camshafts in relation to the crank when it wants to. But again, there was no cam crank codes in the computer. And so I did a cam crank correlation with my Pico scope. I compared the two cam sensors and the crank sensor came up perfect. Okay. My waveform matches the known good. So based on that, I might say, okay, well, this engine must be in time and you need a little bit of an understanding on how this engine is set up. It is a single overhead camshaft chain driven. The chains come up from the crank and they drive a sprocket, which is the VVT sprocket. And that VVT sprocket is bolted to the front of the camshaft. Now, the camshaft sensor is actually mounted onto the front of that VVT sp sprocket. So as the camshaft adjusts, 
it is it moves that tone wheel with it and the computer can tell did it actually adjust when I wanted the VVT to change it can also reference just normal cam and crank reference to see if they're in sync well again the computer saw that this one was in sync I saw that it was in sync okay well where's our issue do we have something else that is causing all the cylinders on this bank to misfire well there were some other clues that led me towards this one being the manifold vacuum level one being offset fuel trims that I, I really did suspect that there still was a timing issue on this even though my cam crank waveform said that there wasn't said that it was in sync so what I did is I went in cylinder and going in cylinder I was actually able to see that my valve timing was off on every single cylinder. I actually only tested the first two because they were easiest to get to, but I could have done the other two and seen the same thing. But every cylinder on that bank, the valve timing was actually off. I was able to see this in my waveform, in cylinder pressure waveform, as compared to the other side of the engine. Now you could go with another known good or you could just compare it to the other side of the engine like I did. I was able to compare the two waveforms and say, yes, I know for sure my valve timing's off. Well, why didn't the computer pick it up? Why didn't my cam crank correlation waveform pick this up well what actually happened was where the camshaft bolts to the back of this sprocket there is a pin that holds it in place well this pin sheared off and the camshaft actually shifted from its normal position so the sprocket was still in time with the chain so there was never a code that was set but the physical camshaft and the position of the cam lobes had moved in reference to the sprocket and the chain and basically correlation to the crank so the valves didn't open at the right time so we got weird manifold vacuum we got misfires on one side of the cylinder we got offset fuel trims one bank was rich one bank was lean and there's obviously other ways that you can spot this but that's not the easiest thing to find uh, you know a camshaft that had actually shifted out of position but the position sensor still says that it's in place well looking at the valve timing using in cylinder pressure testing made this one really easy to identify what was going on now you could go back to using the relative compression test uh, that I mentioned in the previous episode and you could also see it there as well you could see basically every other cylinder would be lower than the next and that's going to point you in the right direction as well uh, again we can use these tests in conjunction with each other but for that particular application the in cylinder pressure test really put the last nail in the coffin I know that this thing is out of time it gives us enough reason to really pull that valve cover off and see what the heck's going on underneath there so again, valve timing, uh, we can do that. The other instance where I've seen this happen is sometimes, and this is older engines generally that don't use VVT, that will have a V style, you know, two bank engine, but they only use one cam sensor on one bank. Okay, so then the other bank really isn't monitored by the computer, and if that bank goes out of time, you'll have some issues with the running, you'll have misfires, you'll have vacuum uh, level issues, but there's not necessarily going to be a timing code, and you can do a cam crank scope, and it's all going to come out good. Again, an in-cylinder pressure test is going to actually show you what you're looking for. It's going to verify that, yes, I definitely have a valve timing issue because you're seeing what's happening inside the cylinder. When are those valves opening and closing? So really powerful in that aspect. We can also use this to verify when ignition timing is happening. Okay, when are we firing that spark plug? Obviously, we know on a running engine, we should have that, you know, just before top dead center of our compression stroke, somewhere in that neighborhood. But here's one thing that can happen is we can actually have some crank reluctor problems. Okay, so the tone wheel that is on the crankshaft that the computer uses to say this is where the crankshaft is I'm gonna fire the spark plug here because this is top dead center for this uh, particular cylinder that can shift through for one reason or another you know Fords they don't have their harmonic balancer with the tone wheel keyed to the crankshaft so if you remove those and you don't use the tools or the markings properly you can put them on incorrectly that's a really common one uh, that's out there that a lot of people run into heck the timing sprocket for the chain is not keyed either so you can really get into a mess if you're not using the special tools on those but that's an instance um, you can have an issue where a crank reluctor is damaged is uh, maybe maybe even incorrect I guess that's kind of getting outside of the scope of what we're seeing here but 
the positioning of that crankshaft as far as what the PCM seeing off of our crankshaft sensor is going to change when that ignition timing is. So if that's messed up, the ignition time is going to be messed up. And we're going to see that in an in-cylinder pressure waveform because we see the pressure, we see where that piston is actually going, and then we can see when sparks happening as well. Now, you know, getting down to the degree is going to be pretty tough there, but when there's a major issue one way or another, it's pretty easy to spot. So we can verify ignition timing. Uh, just t off the top of mind, another time where this was useful, not necessarily for me, but there's a Scanner Danner video out there where he has a Ford V6 engine. And the problem was that the two connectors for two coils right next to each other were swapped. So basically our ignition timing was off for these two cylinders pretty severely and you had misfires and it didn't look like the connectors were that far away from where they should be, um, but they were put on the wrong cylinder. An in-cylinder pressure transducer and using spark timing as well showed that spark is way out from where it's supposed to be. And I think that's how he identified that to move them back into place where they're supposed to be. So um, we can verify where ignition timing is happening within that four stroke cycle and in certain applications that's going to be pretty useful you definitely can't do that with a gauge so now i want to finish the suburban case study with you uh, to show you again how i use these tools in identifying mechanical problems to recap where we left off before i had come in this was a vehicle that they had replaced all of the afm components. So that's active fuel management. They replaced the solenoid assembly in the valley of the engine. They took the head off. They replaced all the lifters, um, obviously the head gasket and all the seals and stuff like that. After they were done, misfire on cylinder one consistently. I verified the misfire on cylinder number one. It was consistent. It was definitely cylinder number one. I performed a relative compression test, which I also verified audibly, but cylinder number one definitely had low compression but it didn't have low compression on the first two revolutions of the engine. So you got to crank it and the engine goes through a couple four stroke cycles and it actually has good compression during those two four stroke cycles on number one. And it showed up on their gauge because they did a compression measurement with a gauge and it came up good. And it showed that on the relative compression test as well. But after those first two revolutions, we had no compression. We were basically missing a mountain peak in that relative compression waveform for cylinder number one. So where did it go? What happened? Well, I want to go in cylinder and see what's happening here. So I go in cylinder and I'll actually put a picture of this waveform up in the Facebook group. So make sure to check that out. Again, it showed me in cylinder, I'm building great compression for those first two cycles. So what I know is this cylinder is totally capable of sealing and of actually breathing okay we're able to evacuate on the exhaust stroke we're able to intake on the intake stroke and we can compress that mixture i mean that's really all you need mechanically speaking for that process to happen so why am i losing it all of a sudden well we do need to understand how this system works it's very important to know what you're working on and of course this is that AFM system and what the system's designed to do is to stop valve movement when it's activated when it goes into v4 mode and cylinder number one is one of the cylinders that uses this active fuel management it is a shutdown cylinder and the way this operates is there are solenoids in the valley of the engine that send oil pressure to certain lifters on cylinders one and seven on this side of the engine and then i think it's four and six on the other side but number one's the one we're focused on here sends oil pressure through a special passageway to these lifters and it actually causes the lifters to collapse and even though there's still camshaft movement there is no rocker arm movement which in turn causes no valve movement and you basically have just a piston going up and down and up and down and it is not actually firing okay so they i don't know if they stop firing the spark plug in those that would be an interesting thing to see but they obviously stop firing the fuel injector while you're going down the road uh, to save on fuel economy that's the whole point now they had a ton of problems with these engines and that's actually why this shop did some work on this now you can have problems with the solenoid assembly in the middle of the engine they replaced that with a gm part 
and you can have problems with the lifters. They stay collapsed when they're not supposed to, and they replace those. So where is the issue here? Well, I'm looking at this, and based on what I can see in this waveform, both of those valves are just stopping after those first two revolutions of the engine. Why after the first two revolutions of the engine? Well, that's about the amount of time that it takes for oil pressure to be developed and make its way up to that point, up to those active fuel management lifters, which again, they get oil pressure for lubrication, but they get oil in a different passageway when they're meant to be activated, or I guess you could say deactivated, but it's oil pressure is the key here that's causing these lifters to actually collapse. But that's not supposed to happen as soon as you start it. That's supposed to happen when you're going down the road and it goes into V4 mode and it shuts down those cylinders on purpose using oil pressure. And the system's actually designed where it won't operate below a certain oil pressure uh, because you need that you need that actual oil getting up there to move those lifters. Again, not supposed to happen when the engine's idling, when you go to crank this engine, because I just cranked the starter to basically take the computer out of the picture. Okay, so I didn't even turn the key on. I just jumped the starter relay, and it was the same thing. I still had the same compression issue. So this is mechanical oil pressure that's causing this to happen, and these valves are not moving. So then the question is, why is this happening? Uh, maybe the solenoid stuck open. Now they did replace this component, and I did actually go in and I activated it, and I used amp probe to measure the current that was going to this solenoid and I could see a pintle hump. I could hear this thing. It sounded just like the others. It's brand new. I really don't think this solenoid is stuck open. So then we're left with one of two things. Either one, these lifters are bad. Uh, kind of weird that there'd be two on the same cylinder that are bad. Or the plastic carrier that holds these lifters in place could also be damaged and allowed these lifters to actually rotate in place or be installed incorrectly because you can only install these one way or you should be able to install them one way into the plastic holders for these lifters and obviously I'm not going to tear the head off to find out which one it is but I told them the head needs to come off you need to look at those lifters and you need to look at the plastic guides as well. Uh, they told me that it, they replaced the lifters with some ones from GM, and that took care of the problem. I don't know for sure whether it was the actual plastic carrier or whether it was the lifters or not, but what I was able to verify was that, hey, you got no compression on this cylinder. The valves aren't moving after a cr couple crank revolutions once oil pressure is developed to do this. They're not supposed to do that. You got to go back in and see what's going on. In cylinder pressure tester allowed me to verify that without really taking a whole lot apart. And the relative compression helped me as well. But going back to the conventional gauge, the gauge showed them compression in that cylinder because those first two pumps of that cylinder pumped up the needle on the compression gauge, showed great compression. After that point, then there wasn't any compression. As long as that engine's running, there's no compression there. And that's where the problem is. So this is how some of these scope tests can kind of get us beyond those conventional tests that just show us a little bit of the picture. We can see a lot more uh, using these tests. So that's going to be it for this episode as far as in-cylinder pressure testing goes. But I want to invite you to take a look at the show notes. I'm going to include some links to other places where you can learn more details on analyzing these waveforms. Because I know I kind of left that out of this episode a little bit because I can't share a picture with you as we're talking. But check out Bernie Thompson's video that he did in the last month or two on these waveforms. Uh, get ready to maybe slow the video down so you can take it all in because the guy's a super genius and he throws a lot of information at you, but it's really good stuff. Uh, so I'll have a link to that. Uh, check out Brandon Steckler on Facebook. He's got some case studies. I'll see if I can find some YouTube videos, uh, some links to put up there. Uh, but also, he actually does classes. He has a whole class where uh, he covers not only in-cylinder pressure testing, but also the intake and exhaust pressure testing and really, really high-level great stuff. So if you have a chance to take one of Brandon Steckler's classes, please do. The third one I'm going to put up here is John Thornton's uh, in-cylinder pressure testing video, which is available for purchase. You got to actually buy this one and it's $140, but I did purchase this. 
it is an awesome awesome video and the great thing about it is you know 140 bucks it's close to what you're going to pay for a night of training but you know you go to a night of training and you bring home a book but you just get it that one time with one of these videos and it's top quality stuff you know John Thornton's one of the best and this video is awesome just like just like all his stuff but you can watch it over and over and over again as many times as you need to to absorb everything or you know maybe a year down the road you don't quite remember all the details you can go to part of that video and review it and that is one really big advantage and why I think it's worth paying the money so I'll have a link to that in the show notes as well be sure to check those out and let me know if you have any questions Other than that, uh, we're going to wrap this one up. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. We will wrap up this series in the next episode and talk about pulse sensors. But until then, let's get out there and start fixing the world one car at a time.